Okay, so uh, uh, please interrupt me. Uh, I promise I'll stop in an hour, even if you ask lots of questions. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this talk is about the influence of electron-electron interactions on topological phase transitions between uh, normal and topological states. So uh, in this case, the topological properties are associated with single particle properties, band structure, and I'm going to talk about the way in which electron-electron uh, interactions to influence uh, phase transitions between topological and non-topological states. I guess tomorrow we're going to hear about uh, uh, systems in which the topological properties are due to interactions in the first place. So this uh, talk is drawn from work by uh, some students. Uh, um, uh, Feng Cheng Wu is now a postdoc at Argon, Argonne. Uh, Fei Zhu is um, just leaving to be a postdoc at NIST. And uh, some of the work I will mention just briefly at the very end was done together uh, with a visitor, Juan Ho Palacios from uh, Madrid. OK, so I'm um, going to start with, with some uh, few, few uh, remarks about uh, context. Uh, <coughs> so I'm talking about electron-electron uh, interactions near phase transitions between uh, <coughs> between uh, normal insulators and topological insulators. So uh, by the very nature of this problem, uh, we're interested in systems in which, uh, which we have crossing bands or nearly crossing bands. And uh, in situation, here's a one example of a situation where we, a famous situation where we have crossing bands, which is the 2D material graphene. I'm going to be speaking entirely about two-dimensional materials. Uh, a lot of the remarks I'm going to make apply with some little changes to three-dimensional materials. Um, uh, this is actually the case of uh, bilayer graphene, and uh, uh, which has crossing bands at actually the, uh, as, as most of you know, near the corners of the honeycomb lattice uh, Bruin zone. And uh, the important thing uh, about this is that the bands are uh, close together in energy, in effect, that acts like a narrow band system, uh, and strong correlations are possible because of uh, having these states near the Fermi energy that are close together in energy uh, only over a small part of the Bruin zone. And uh, uh, so interactions are strong, not everywhere in momentum space but only in a small part of momentum space. And because if the relevant states are only in a small part of momentum space, if I uh, uh, want to make a uh, variation of electron density uh, for, the, uh, uh, for Coulomb interactions, for example, the, uh, I can only make Fourier components with sort of, uh, with, uh, uh, a size of order the difference between uh, the momentum states that are playing an important role. And what that means is that uh, that electron-electron interactions out to, um, uh, out to large distances are necessarily important. So for the physics I'm talking about, uh, you can't use a Hubbard model. It has to be real Coulomb interactions between electrons. You could have, if it were true that you had a honeycomb lattice system, let's say, with the structure of graphene that had uh, very strong interactions uh, compared to the entire width of the pi bands, then uh, you could approximately describe that system by a Hubbard model. But we know that's not the case in, uh, uh, in, mo <coughs> in the systems I'm interested in. and so. Um, uh, so we're only interested in uh, correlations among states in a sm small range of momentum space, and that means you can't ignore the long range of the Coulomb interaction. And as David Pines uh, taught us a long time ago, that means uh, the first, your first job is to really deal with the long range of the Coulomb interaction and properly count for uh, dynamical uh, screening and so on, which I mostly won't do in what I'll say. but. Uh, um, 
but when you have long-range Coulomb interactions, uh, a lot of the techniques that we use for interacting electron systems uh, really uh, uh, don't work very well. So it's an interesting uh, kind of system. Okay, so I'm going to talk. Uh, part of my talk is going to touch on uh, uh, excitons uh, and uh, excitons acting like bosons. And there are two kinds of collective excitations that are common in metals that act like bosons, and I want to uh, make a contrast between them. Uh, so uh, <coughs> this is uh, uh, represented by Feynman diagrams. Uh, this is an interaction between electrons, and these labels are, are band labels. So C, for example, can stand for conduction band. And, uh, so uh, this Feynman diagram, as you know, correspond, uh, you know, represents uh, having uh, a mixing between uh, in some, uh, let's say, incoming electrons get scattered into a final state uh, with a different momentum, and the mixing between those creates a charge density with wave vector equal to the momentum transfer, and that can interact with some other incoming particle. Okay. And uh, so um, the uh, long range of the Coulomb interaction is uh, uh, its importance is connected with the fact that the Fourier transform of the interparticle interaction diverges at small q. And uh, so, if we're interested in, uh, for many purposes, if we're interested in these interactions, we can forget about the corresponding exchange processes, which uh, uh, in which um, uh, let's say uh, inter um, uh, well, we can't really uh, distinguish the outcoming states, so the, this type of process is uh, always important, but uh, t uh, it doesn't have necessarily have a uh, small momentum transfer, uh, even if we're looking at interactions among long wavelength particle hole excitations. And uh, <clears throat> so th therefore, we can often uh, just deal with this direct interaction. And so I want to contrast that with the case of uh, excitons. So excitons are generally collective modes in a crystal formed from interband transitions, let's say conduction and valence, or valence and conduction. And <clears throat> the point is that uh, because the uh, uh, different bands in a solid have wave functions that are orthogonal when they're at the same wave vector. Uh, the matrix elements between uh, these states vanish in the long wavelength limit, and the Hartree interaction that dominates for intraband particle hole excitations uh, is suppressed at long wavelength by uh, factors of uh, wave vector. And then it turns out that typically the exchange process, uh, exchange interactions between the particle hole excitations dominate. And so the end result of that is uh, when you have, when you look at uh, a system with um, uh, particle hole excitations, uh, there's a collective mode, collective modes called, typically called plasmons, emerge above the particle hole continuum due to repulsive interactions among all of the particle hole excitations. Uh, whereas if I look at interband particle hole excitations, then, uh, then these attractive interactions dominate and a collective mode appears uh, below the particle hole continuum, and that's uh, what we call excitons. And so I won't touch on this um, uh, in detail in this talk, but when I have a narrow gap system, then I have both intraband and, uh, uh, and inter interband particle hole fluctuations going on at the same time. And uh, so all of these uh, have to be incorporated um, in the appropriate way. OK, so that's just uh, a couple of remarks that will be uh, relevant to what I will say in one way or another. Uh, my main, uh, my main uh, topic uh, concerns the inter effect of electron-electron interactions on transitions between uh, a normal insulator and a topological insulator in two dimensions. And uh, I'm going to most of the time discuss 
systems that are described by this uh, Bernavig use Zhang model. This is a, a model, once a common scenario for two dimensional topological insulators. It's uh, the uh, Hamiltonian that's appropriate for uh, uh, 3 5 semiconductor quantum well systems like mercury telluride, uh, uh, cadmium telluride quantum wells, or indium arsenide, gallium antimonide. And as I'll say at the end, also to some of the uh, transition metal dichalcogenide systems. And uh, <coughs> so in this Hamiltonian, uh, so the states that are close to the Fermi level, the crossing bands I was referring to uh, in this 2D system are in practice uh, an S state and a P state, atomic S state, atomic P state derived orbitals. And uh, the S state I call the conduction band in this uh, Hamiltonian and the P state I call the valence band. And uh, <coughs> so there, uh, the Hamiltonian projected onto a particular spin is not time, uh, not time reversal invariant, but there is a time reversal invari invariant partner for this two by two Hamiltonian. So uh, in the uh, <coughs> Um, in the non-interacting electron picture of the uh, uh, phase transition between topological and non-topological states uh, that occurs when you have band inversion in this system, you can uh, uh, understand simply in terms of this block sphere kind of picture. Uh, because I have decoupled up spins and down spins, this is really literally uh, a quantum spin hall type system. And the topological state has uh, has uh, 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 quantum Hall effects has churn numbers for uh, of opposite sign for the up spins and down spins, and uh, <coughs> when you go to very large momentum uh, away from the gamma point where this uh, model uh, applies the center of the Bruin zone, then the conduction band state is uh, high in energy, as uh, in this model reflected by this upward dispersion of the conduction band. So in the block sphere picture, uh, let's call the conduction band the North Pole, for example, then states of large momentum are at the uh, North Pole of this block sphere. And if you have band inversion, states at k equals zero, uh, when the valence band is lower in energy, are at the south pole, the valence band state. And of course, uh, it's a property of the symmetry of the crystal that there's no coupling between the S-like and P-like states at k equals zero, which is the center of the Bruin zone. And that's going to be important in uh, what I'm going to talk about. Um, and uh, <coughs> so, uh, so this, uh, 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 in this model, then, it's obvious that uh, because the uh, hybridization between the uh, S-like and P-like states just by symmetry uh, must go like uh, Kx minus Iky or Kx plus Iky uh, as you go uh, to finite momentum. Uh, that means that if I represent the, for example, lower energy eigenstate of this 2 by 2 Hamiltonian by a, uh, a direction on the block sphere, as we often do for uh, two-level systems, then uh, when I integrate over momentum space near k equals zero, I'll go from the north pole to the south pole. And when I go around circles in momentum space, I'll wind around the sphere. So I'll cover the entire sphere once, which is a, uh, makes a state topological. So that's the kind of uh, topological state we're interested in in the non-interacting electron picture. And as I said, my interest is in saying a few things about how interactions can change this picture. And I'm going to do it in this way. This is the phase diagram, and I'll come back to this later. Uh, I'm going to talk, start talking about the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this phase diagram, A and B, and then at, uh, toward the end, come back and talk about the middle. Uh, you can see that according to uh, what I'm going to say, various things can happen. Uh, <coughs> the, um, uh, the little inset here shows uh, uh, one th of the systems in which this phase diagram can be explore explored. Uh, 
indium, arsenide, gallium, and timonide uh, quantum well systems. And the phase diagram has along the vertical axis the what is labeled here as an energy gap. You might see in some later slides it's labeled as a chemical potential, but it's basically the tunable energy difference between the conduction band and the valence band, uh, which you can uh, typically tune in these systems, um, uh, in particular because the uh, conduction band is usually in this, is in this, more or less in this indium arsenide quantum well, and the valence band, uh, 2D valence band state I was talking about is in the gallium antimonide. So because they're in different layers, you can use gate, gate voltages or gates to uh, shift their relative energies and move along this axis. Uh, <coughs> and go in particular um, from a small energy gap to an inverted gap. Uh, uh, this axis on the phase diagram is interaction strength. It's actually inverse interaction strength. So Strong interactions are on the left, weak interactions are on the right. Uh, this quantity A is the band hybridization. And uh, uh, along this interaxis, I've turned it into something dimensionless uh, by, uh, by um, uh, inserting uh, as energy and length units the energy and length units associated with Coulomb interactions. There are various ways in which you could draw this phase diagram. Uh, but uh, this is the uh, effective uh, Rydberg for Coulomb electron-electron interactions of the system. And this is the Bohr radius as, um, uh, yep. Can you, can you say again on the diagram on the upper right, where is the 2D system? So uh, the conduction band system I was talking about is typically localized in the indium arsenide quantum well. Uh, and the, uh, uh, and the valence band in the gallium antimonide quantum well. Uh, this model um, you know, applies to many different systems, but perhaps it's more, most tunable uh, in this case. And it's tunable not only because you can uh, more easily use gates to switch the uh, difference between the conduction and valence band energies. As you may recall, you can also do that in mercury telluride by uh, changing the quantum well width. Um, but you can't do it in situ in gates. But the other important thing is uh, this parameter A is hybridization between the two bands. Yes. And uh, uh, by putting some barrier material like aluminum and timonide uh, between the indium arsenide and gallium timonide, uh, uniquely for this system, uh, you can make A bigger or smaller. Whereas with mercury, uh, Telluride, your uh, A tends to be big, and you're more or less stuck with uh, what nature says it is, okay? because the conduction and valence bands are in the same quantum well. OK? Uh, OK, so I can come back to that um, uh, later if anybody has any questions. OK, so as I said, I'm going to start um, <coughs> uh, along the left-hand side axis uh, of that phase diagram, no hybridization between conduction and valence bands. So um, in that limit, the two bands are really uh, distinguishable, uh, and uh, there's no hybridization between the two bands. So this is, uh, there are some special simplifications uh, in that limit, which we'll take advantage of. Uh, of course, uh, I, I go through this. Uh, as I was saying in words before, or more in Feynman diagrams, uh, when I, uh, if I think about uh, that case, uh, I have a uh, electron conduction band, a valence band. Uh, if there's no hybridization, they're really distinguishable. Uh, when I make particle hole excitations, uh, there's, uh, because of electron hole attraction or electron electron exchange interactions, it's the same thing in a different language. There's a uh, set of collective modes, uh, uh, which you can, uh, which are basically uh, excitons that have a dispersion as a function of momentum, and um, um, <coughs> and uh, when the excitons are dilute, uh, you can really uh, treat them as uh, bosons. And bosons, of course, even in two dimensions, essentially, bose condense at low temperature. Uh, 
So uh, we know uh, along the left-hand axis that if we tune the energy gap uh, um, uh, from a large value, a large gap semiconductor, towards the narrow gap semiconductor, as we approach crossing between these two bands, uh, we will, before the band gap goes to zero, we'll start to introduce a population of spatially indirect excitons uh, into the ground state of the system, and uh, they will both condense just as Einstein, more or less as Einstein, uh, taught us a long time ago. So, maybe the, the name excitonic insulator is more appropriate here than the body condensation of excitons. So this is an excitonic insulator, and it's a two-dimensional excitonic insulator. And of course, the notion of an excitonic insulator has been touched, uh, discussed for a long time, and has been very difficult to realize. And you know, historically, there's been sometimes controversy about it, and a lot of that controversy has to do with the fact that in real 3D systems, for example, there are always hybridization between the crossing bands, whereas in two-dimensional materials, that hybridization between the crossing bands can be, uh, uh, can be essentially zero, uh, can be tuned experimentally. So here we're talking about the limit in which it's, uh, uh, um, it's exactly zero. Right, so this state is, an ex uh, is a state that's often called an excitonic insulator along, uh, along this axis. And uh, the main point I want to you know, get across about this limit is that it's very simple and uh, we know very rigorously what's going on. Because when we have one electron in one hole, they form a bound state, a 1s exciton state. And if the density of those 1s excitons that were, uh, you know, people often uh, talk about uh, systems with many excitons uh, created by illuminating the system, some kind of uh, non-equilibrium state. Here I'm talking about equilibrium states of the system. And uh, uh, in a region where uh, the band gap here called uh, chemical potential is just a little bit bigger than the binding energy, uh, <coughs> um, then uh, I have a population of uh, uh, excitons in the ground state. Uh, in this illustration, the um, uh, horizontal axis is the separation between the two layers. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, or as you can see, in this uh, case we're thinking of uh, making 2D systems from transition metal dichalcogenides, that's not too important for what I'm going to say here. Uh, but the separation between the layers uh, can be varied. And uh, uh, when the chemical potential um, is uh, close to the uh, binding energy, which is actually, as you may recall, four Rydbergs in, uh, in the two-dimensional case at zero layer separation, but decreases with layer separation, then close to this line, the exciton density is low. And um, then we know uh, the state's very simple, and we know exactly what it is. Basically, it's a 2D system of bosons with weakly, weakly repulsive interactions. And there are various complications here that I won't discuss, uh, in particular um, uh, associated with uh, the fact that uh, there are various um, flavors of excitons uh, um, associated with valley or spin degrees of freedom and uh, uh, phase transitions can occur uh, associated with breaking the valley or spin symmetries. Okay? So uh, on the left-hand side, there's an exciton condensate. That's uh, the main thing I want to get across. Uh, so incidentally, let me just, since it's, uh, um, uh, since, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, just uh, make a mention of some very interesting recently experiments from the lab from the lab of my my colleague Emmanuel Tutuk, uh, published recently in PhysRev Letters, and uh, <coughs> um, there's actually, uh, as uh, many of you know, there's been uh, lots of interesting work over the last 20 years or so uh, 
on bilayer exciton condensate excitonic insulator states, if you like, in, um, uh, in the case of uh, a magnetic uh, field in the quantum Hall regime. Uh, but recently, uh, Emmanuel Tutuk and uh, his uh, students and uh, postdocs have succeeded in really clearly demonstrating the formation of a spatially indirect exciton condensate state in, uh, in uh, 2D materials in the absence of a magnetic field using graphene bilayers as the two-dimensional electron systems and transition metal dichalcogenides <coughs> as the barrier between them. And uh, so, um, uh, yeah, maybe I'll just uh, uh, briefly uh, uh, describe the experimental evidence for this. Uh, so <coughs> um, uh, on the right-hand side are some of uh, Emmanuel's, um, uh, now this is actually uh, theory, <laughs> but uh, um, there's experimental data that look very much like the theory. And uh, what I'm showing you now is just single particle uh, theory of uh, having two graphene bilayers. Uh, in these various illustrations, the, uh, uh, showing the band structure of bilayer graphene, which might be uh, uh, similar, uh, familiar to many of you. Uh, one graphene bilayer band structure is uh, in blue in this plot, and the other one is red. And um, uh, <coughs> uh, these, uh, uh, what's uh, sh being varied in this phase diagram is a bias voltage between the two layers in these tunneling experiments, uh, and the other axis is a gate voltage. And uh, these various points here uh, uh, show the region in which tunneling occurs. And the, the lines always occur when you have, uh, when you have states um, that have the same energy and the same momentum in one bilayer and the other. And among all of these various situations, there's one which is um, uh, special, 0.6 here. You can see uh, there you have graphene bilayer in blue, which, uh, as you may remember, has an energy gap. You can see this gap here. And then there's a bilayer graphene in red. That's the other bilayer system that is, um, uh, that is uh, separated by tunnel barrier and therefore has distinguishable electrons. And uh, at this point, their uh, Fermi surfaces are, uh, are nested. They have the same Fermi surfaces. One has a electron-like Fermi surface with occupied states inside this region of momentum space. The other one has a hole-like Fermi surface with occupied states uh, outside. And this is just the case where in the weak coupling limit, uh, not like I was talking about um, uh, before, uh, you expect a basically a uh, uh, electron hole a pair instability analogous to the BCS instability. And uh, this is indeed uh, what he sees. Uh, <coughs> at all of the other points in this phase diagram where there's enhanced tunneling, um, nothing is temperature dependent. But at this point, uh, the t uh, tunneling conductance grows with uh, decreasing temperature and, and eventually actually diverges, which is uh, a symptom of or a signal of spontaneous coherence between these disconnected layers, which is exciton condensation. But that would be through a finite temperature transition? Uh, so presumably, uh, yes, it, uh, it, um, it is a finite temperature, costless thallus type, strictly speaking, phase transition. Which you don't see in the experiment. So, uh, so um, uh, this is temperature. Uh, so uh, there is a temperature not shown here at which the interlayer conductance is immeasurably large. So it looks, it seems to diverge below a certain temperature, become <coughs> non-ohmic in other words. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, summary of that part of my talk is that uh, if we really have two-dimensional electron systems that are uh, spatially separated so that they don't hybridize. Uh, 
we understand how the interaction physics works. We have 2D uh, uh, excitonic insulator transitions that occur near when the bands cross. Okay? Now we want to uh, look at what happens when we start to consider cases where we have crossing bands that are hybridized with each other. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm going to start on the right hand side here. Uh, uh, this um, parameter is uh, uh, the, what is written here as an energy gap is the place where the bands cross. But um, when you include interaction, uh, the uh, place where the bands cross, uh, energy gap equals zero, is actually shifted by interaction effects. So this line going to the right here that uh, includes the point B is uh, once I include the self-energies that renormalize the band energy, uh, this is the line along which the conduction and valence bands at zero momentum just touch. So um, along this line then, uh, the physics is, uh, looks like the physics of, uh, of, uh, of um, single layer graphene, right? Because I have a single Dirac cone uh, with, uh, uh, at this point, if there's no energy gap, then in a single particle theory, I would have linear band crossing uh, at this point. And uh, so how do, uh, how do interactions affect linear band crossings? Well, that's a problem that's actually received a lot of attention theoretically and experimentally even before, uh, uh, even before um, uh, graphene systems were made, uh, were realized experimentally. So let me, uh, whoops, say a few words about it. And I'm going to uh, use the language of graphene here. Um, um, uh, but uh, it can uh, just as well be uh, these, um, uh, uh, just can just as well be a um, uh, system close to a normal insulator, uh, topological insulator phase transition, looking uh, just at the point where the bands cross. So in the graphene case, uh, the two bands, of course, are related to the two honeycombs uh, sublattices of uh, two uh, sublattices, um, triangular lattice sublattices in the honeycomb A and B sublattices of a honeycomb lattice. Uh, <coughs> and um, if you take my starting Hamiltonian and look at the special case in which the, uh, the, two, the band energies at zero momentum are the same, that's the band crossing point, then <coughs> the two by two Hamiltonian eigenstates we can uh, uh, represent, if we represent them on a block sphere, that's what I'm doing here, then uh, the um, uh, then the uh, Hamiltonian, if I view it as a pseudospin Hamiltonian, because the diagonal elements of the Hamiltonian are zero, at, uh, are, are, sorry, are, are the same, there's no uh, effective magnetic field in the z direction. And I said the band hybridization, the only term in the Hamiltonian at this point is the band hybridization within this model anyway. And the band hybridization is a complex off-diagonal matrix element whose phase winds as you go around momentum space. Or in terms of an effective magnetic field, it's an effective magnetic field acting on the pseudospin degree of freedom whose direction uh, uh, is the same as the direction of momentum. It winds at least when the momentum direction winds by 2 pi. And so this is a picture, there's kind of a vortex in momentum space uh, in the, that's formed by the, um, uh, let's say this is a, a pictorial representation of the valence band states in bilayer graphene. And um, um, and so that property of the valence band states at the band crossings is not a property that electron-electron interactions like. Uh, so this is uh, uh, 
uh, this is kind of a, an illustration of a, um, the point I want to make. Uh, and uh, we're talking about 2D uh, Dirac equations, effective magnetic field coupling to pseudospin degree of freedom and the effective magnetic field points in the direction of momentum. And uh, <coughs> uh, as you can see here, when uh, in this illustration, when k is equal to zero, uh, there's an energy difference between the two bands because I've added a mass term uh, which remains finite at finite momentum. So this term would be present, for example, if I went a little bit away from the band crossing point. And the main thing I want to emphasize here is that if I look at the occupied states here, then um, <coughs> uh, the occupied states in the valence band in red are just opposite to those in the conduction band. And uh, they, uh, <coughs> the state changes rapidly as momentum changes. And uh, when I have Coulomb interactions, then the most important interactions are interactions between states that have similar momentum. Because I said it, as I said at the beginning, the strength of the Coulomb interaction is, uh, uh, you know, uh, diverges at long wavelength. Its uh, exchange interactions are strong between states with different momentum and uh, um, with uh, similar momentum. And for that reason, uh, it's, uh, um, it frustrates the interaction physics when the orbital state of the electrons is changing rapidly as the momentum changes. And um, uh, so this is uh, an, um, an issue in, in graphene systems. Uh, <coughs> and uh, it's uh, actually uh, closely related to uh, toy models that people have studied in particle physics. Uh, 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 Two-dimensional uh, uh, Dirac models um, where uh, having a spontaneous gap is um, analogous to uh, gaps of some of the uh, particles uh, in nuclear physics. And um, uh, so this problem has uh, the relativistic invariant version of this prob interacting problem has been studied a lot. Uh, in particle physics, and there's a nice article by Gordon Semenov you can find uh, 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 on the archive. And uh, <coughs> um, so, uh, indeed, a long time ago, people suggested that in the case of graphene, it would have a gap that uh, 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 due to electron electron interactions, and we know that such a gap is possible, only occurs when interactions are strong enough. And many people claim that graphene is just on the verge of having some interaction-induced mass. I don't think we really know that for sure. But uh, uh, this is uh, the continuum model version of that, labeled here for j equal 1 for linear band crossing. And um, uh, <coughs> this is some measure of interaction strength, in this case, with strong interactions on the right. And um, you know, so. Uh, uh, on the right of this red line, that would represent uh, a state with a spontaneously generated gap. And so we know from experiment that we don't quite get there in the case of graphene, but it, it's possible uh, to have interaction-induced gaps. Uh, in the case of bilayer graphene, where I ha we have quadratic band crossing, then indeed uh, 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 interactions uh, do necessarily make the single particle state instability, uh, uh, unstable. And that system actually uh, does have an interaction-induced gap that has been seen experimentally. And um, um, so let me <coughs> uh, not talk about that in too much detail. But that means that uh, coming back to my phase diagram again, uh, I talked about A, I have an excitonic insulator state. Uh, now I'm talking about B. Uh, this is a basically massless Dirac model at the band crossing point along this line. And as I go to the left, then I have stronger and stronger interactions. And at some point, 
uh, I'm going to have a spontaneously uh, induced gap. And, uh, and that gives rise to an instability here uh, to a state which is a quantum anomalous uh, Hall state. And uh, <coughs> uh, the reason it's uh, a quantum anomalous Hall state that occurs uh, in, um, this is all theory, uh, not, not verified experimentally, but what we're predicting is that as you tune this uh, hybridization parameter uh, to the left, and there'll be a region where you, a, quant a quantum anomalous Hall state occurs. And <coughs> um, uh, what's going on that in that region is basically that uh, uh, a gap uh, that as you tune this parameter, the single particle energy gap, uh, that's like taking, uh, um, uh, that acts like an external magnetic field and uh, um, uh, basically the system will uh, jump from uh, having a, uh, a finite, uh, jump from having uh, one type of band alignment by a first order transition to having the inverted band alignment. Uh, but it turns out it does that for one spin a, uh, at a time. Uh, the ground state only inverts, inverts spins for one, uh, inverts the bands of one spin before the other spin. If you invert the, the bands of both spins, then you go from a normal insulator to a, uh, a quantum spin hall insulator. But if you just invert for one spin, uh, then you have uh, a net. Then you have um, a net quantum uh, uh, anomalous Hall effect. Um, whereas when you go into the quantum spin Hall state, as I uh, said before, the upspin and downspin contributions to the quantum anomalous Hall effect cancel. Okay. <coughs> okay. So uh, now I've talked about A and B. Let me talk about C. So, uh, uh, so uh, something simple happens on the left. Uh, something not so simple. Uh, yep, go ahead. Can you give an insight as to why it's energetically favorable only for one spin to uh, one spin? Um, so uh, let's um, uh, uh, um, if you think about it, um, you know it's it's kind of connected to a grand canonical and canonical ensemble. <laughs> the uh, uh, um, uh, the energy gap kinds of acts like a chemical potential for uh, how many pseudo spins are inverted, if you like. And uh, um, uh, uh, this system is um, graphene, let's say, if I view if I use a spin language, graphene is a system with a spin-dependent magnetic field. Okay? And the ordered states have spontaneous spin polarization up or down. And I can add an external magnetic field which favors up or down. And just so it's a kind of Ising magnet, if you like. And uh, just like normal magnetic systems, there's hysteresis. And it can get stuck in upspin or downspin. Right? So the role of the energy gap is like an external magnetic field. So if I'm way down here, uh, <coughs> uh, um, it will be, you know, the magnetization will be, let's say, down corresponding to non-adverted bands. And uh, ignoring the spin degree of freedom, then there would be some, you know, metastability. And uh, at some point it would flip to being up, right? It can be up or down, and both will be stable for some reason. But this is uh, uh, um, uh, but when it has the opportunity to do something different for 
two different flavors of this, then uh, it's able to, uh, you know, polarize the what is the physical upspin subspace um, uh, uh, by polarizing them in opposite sense. It gets a favorable number of uh, uh, inverted spins. Okay. Anyway, uh, um, Actually, yeah, yeah. So this, this phase diagram is, is calculated by minimizing some Hartree Fock. Yeah, this is all Hartree Fock. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <coughs> okay. So, um, yeah. So, uh, w uh, what I've said here is we know exactly what happens here. Uh, we know uh, that <coughs> when we have linearly crossing bands following along, that's following along the, you know, the what would be in the non-interacting theory, the tra phase transition line. When we have linearly crossing bands and when the interactions get strong enough, something will happen. And that something is formation of this quantum anomalous hull. Uh, state in which I have inverted bands for one spin and not for the other. And now I want to say about how can we piece these two things together, okay? So what happens, uh, how can you go from having an excitonic insulator to having this linear band crossing? So that's uh, uh, the last thing I will talk about. And so really uh, everything I've said so far is just a, a preface for this. And here I've written down the uh, 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 Bernevig Yu Zhang uh, model Hamiltonian for a 2D topological insulator, normal insulator phase transition, just the single particle term, kinetic energy, energy gap, band hybridization, that's spin dependent. And uh, <coughs> um, uh, and when we include interactions, as I've kind of said already, uh, all of these parameters uh, are renormalized by interactions. In particular, in particular, the band hybridization can be renormalized by interactions. And uh, <coughs> um, so, whoops. So let me ignore the spin degree of freedom for a moment and first explain, uh, you know, the how you get from uh, the left-hand side to the right-hand side of that phase diagram um, <coughs> uh, if you didn't have uh, uh, an extra spin degree of freedom. And how, uh, this, so how do I go from a normal insulator to a topological insulator uh, in, the mean uh, in mean field theory when I have a state that I can understand in terms of band interaction with renormalized parameters, including parameters that are allowed to break symmetries. And uh, so the, <coughs> in this language, the language of that Hamiltonian, uh, let me uh, say a few words about, you know, what you need to do to get into the topological insulator state. So um, um, the two by two uh, Hamiltonian, including self-energy corrections, uh, has a uh, a term proportional to the Z Pauli operator, a difference between uh, conduction and valence band renormalized energies. So the coefficient, that difference is a real number. And uh, uh, that real number um, crosses zero, can cross zero somewhere in momentum space. And uh, so the condition that the difference between these energies be zero in a two-dimensional momentum space defines a line. And so here I've called this the zero mass line. That's just where the band uh, crossing occurs in momentum space. If I did this for, uh, if I did this for uh, uh, non-interacting electrons, then the zero mass line would, um, uh, <coughs> would start at when the bands first touch at k equals zero, and then it would move out in momentum space as I go to more strongly inverted bands. So, th so this line, for example, is calculated for a case where I have slightly inverted bands. Okay. So the other uh, the other part of the two by two uh, Hamiltonian, including self-energy corrections, 
is the band hybridization. And uh, <coughs> in order to have a band touching point, the band hybridization also has to go to zero. In the single particle Hamiltonian, just by symmetry, the band Hamiltonian vanishes at k equals zero. Uh, because at the center of the Bruin zone, uh, I can't have, um, by symmetry, can't have mixing between an s orbital and a p orbital. So what happens in the exciton condensate state? The exciton condensate state can be described as a state with spontaneous coherence between bands. That means there's a self-energy uh, created uh, uh, by breaking symmetries in the interacting state which induces coherence between, uh, <coughs> between the s ele electron and p electron. And the exciton state uh, in the exciton condensate is an S state. And that means that the band hybridization in the exciton condensate state along the left hand axis uh, doesn't change with the direction of momentum. Okay? So, uh, <coughs> um, uh, <coughs> so that means, and, and it's finite and actually has its maximum as, at k equals zero, whereas the band Hamiltonian, that term vanishes at k equals zero. And at the band crossing point, that, has, that total thing, including all interaction effects, has to vanish somewhere in momentum space. So if I mix a little bit, if I start just go um, uh, just a little bit, whoops, to just a little bit to the right of the left-hand axis, I have a little bit of band hybridization. And I start from an exciton condensate. That means I'll add to the effective Hamiltonian something that's uh, a linear function of k uh, that vanishes at k equals zero. I will add it to something that's um, there due to the exciton condensate, which is finite at k equals zero. And the sum of those actually, when the band mixing term is small enough, will be uh, vanish only at very large momentum, right? And in this picture, what happens is the interactions are strong enough that uh, uh, as I evolve from the exciton from the A equals zero, the, uh, <coughs> uh, the point where that self-energy vanishes is along some line in momentum space, because this is basically an xy type broken symmetry. And, uh, but it moves in from infinity. And uh, what actually happens in a system that doesn't have an extra spin degree of freedom is it suddenly jumps from this broken symmetry state, which actually has broken rotational symmetry because uh, it has hybridization between s and p orbitals that doesn't vanish at k equals zero. So this is a pneumatic state, and there's a first order phase transition as a function of band hybridization strength. Uh, where this uh, um, point where the uh, hybridization between the bands vanishes, the point of momentum space jumps to the uh, symmetry, uh, uh, the par uh, point that's dictated by the uh, symmetries of a single particle Hamiltonian jumps to k equals zero from finite k. Okay? So that's, um, that's what would happen, and that's what we actually thought happened in these systems. Um, uh, <coughs> uh, before we started to explore uh, the phase space. Uh, but uh, <coughs> uh, when I, and that's what would happen if I didn't have an extra spin degree of freedom. So it turns out, at least in mean field theory, that what happens uh, instead when I add the spin degree of freedom is something similar but slightly different. And uh, so again, this behavior has not been seen experimentally, but it should be possible to observe in this indium arsenide gallium and timonide system by moving uh, using experimentally controlled parameters along either this axis or this axis, uh, that what happens in this region is uh, 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 I will show you in just a moment. And um, by um, uh, saying, uh, showing you uh, an index, let's say, of what, ha uh, of what the state is doing going along this line. So I'm going to show you a slide that goes along this line in the phase space. And the basic thing that happens when I include spin is that uh, <coughs> the, uh, as um, without spin, uh, 
the band hybridization frustrates this 1s exciton condensate state. And um, so what happens when you include spin is the system wants to form an exciton condensate not with the valence band state of the same spin, which is frustrated, but the valence band uh, conduction band will have spontaneous coherence with the valence band state of the opposite spin. And uh, uh, <coughs> uh, so that's what it does. And that's not frustrated. And that's why that's preferred. But there are two ways uh, you can do this. You can uh, make the spontaneous coherence between a uh, electron, let's say conduction band electron with one spin and a valence band electron with the opposite spin. Uh, you can make it have a uh, uh, change sign uh, as you change both spin labels or not change sign. It turns out one of those breaks time reversal symmetry, making some kind of magnetic state and the other doesn't break time reversal. And uh, this plot, uh, which goes along the line in, uh, in the phase diagram that I just talked about, uh, <coughs> goes from on the left-hand side somewhere in the normal insulator state to the right-hand side somewhere in the quantum spin hall or 2D topological insulator state. Uh, <coughs> and uh, the uh, this is actually a plot of an order parameter. Uh, uh, it also is qualitatively equivalent to a plot of, uh, of the energy gap of the system. And the blue line here is the uh, energy gap. Let's, let me just call it energy gap moving through the phase diagram from the normal insulator to the topological insulator. And the thing you notice there is that the gap goes to zero. And of course, you know quite generally, if uh, uh, the, to go from a normal insulator to a topological insulator, that can only happen if the gap goes to zero somewhere, right? And uh, <coughs> but um, the red line is the actual ground state of the system uh, uh, in mean field theory, and uh, you notice that the gap. Uh, doesn't close. So it, uh, the state evolves from a normal insulator to a topological insulator without the gap ever closing. Uh, it does so, it's allowed to do so, of course, by uh, breaking time reversal symmetry. So this is a state with broken time reversal symmetry. It actually has, it's an insulator state. It also breaks rotational symmetry, so it's a pneumatic state. And it has zero churn number, though. Uh, uh, and the reason it's the ground state is because it can still have an energy gap, maintain an energy gap all the way through the transition from a normal insulator to a topological insulator. Okay, so that's my basic story. Uh, first two parts were just to uh, uh, show you that there uh, has to be something interesting that occurs between the uh, 2D exciton condensate state and the single particle uh, transition between a um, uh, normal and uh, uh, topological uh, insulator in two dimensions. Uh, and uh, so we've made some predictions about what does happen, predictions not yet tested experimentally, but I think testable. And they will be tested in coming years. And let me just mention in uh, ending here that uh, that there's another class of uh, two-dimensional topological uh, uh, insulators that has been getting some attention recently. This is the 1T prime phase of the, uh, the uh, two-dimensional topological insulators. And uh, so we've been applying similar, we're working on applying similar uh, considerations to these types of systems. Uh, so, f you know, uh, basically the 1T prime of molybdenum disulfide, it turns out, is uh, uh, basically described by an anisotropic version of the BHZ model. And so I think a uh, more or less similar story applies there. Of course, in these systems, you don't have the ability to tune the um, uh, strength, uh, the size of the banded version and the hybridization strength between the bands separately. Uh, um, 
<coughs> so uh, there's some less, uh, less experimental flexibility. But the tungsten ditelluride system, which has uh, uh, shown experimentally to be a topological insulator by ARPAS, for example, and has uh, been recently shown to be a superconductor, uh, uh, we think this is really uh, quite different interaction physics going on in this system. And, uh, uh, but uh, related to these kinds of ideas, but uh, it's really described by a different kind of model. And, um, uh, uh, and we think uh, interactions might be the explanation for the fact that in band structure calculations, this system actually comes out to be a semi-metal. Uh, but uh, in fact, experimentally, it's clear that it's quite a large gap uh, topological insulator. Okay, so I think I've used up uh, all of my time. So thanks for your attention. Uh, uh, this one? From red, yeah, from red to blue. So uh, this state, of course, has zero churn number. So uh, in this model, it has, uh, uh, has uh, you know, one churn number for upspins, the opposite churn number for downspins. Uh, that's the quantum spin, quantum spin hall state. Uh, of course, uh, for general model, um, which doesn't break time reversal, I need to classify it by <coughs> Z2 invariance, but yeah. Uh, but <coughs> uh, this is a plot actually of an order parameter as a function of position in phase diagram uh, along this line going from the normal insulator on the left hand side of that uh, plot to the quantum spin hall insulator through this state in which we are predicting that the way the system makes a compromise between wanting to have an excitonic insulator and uh, the way it evolves from an excitonic insulator basically into this quantum spin hall state is uh, by breaking time reversal symmetry in an unusual way which um, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't make a non-zero churn number. It's an insulated state with broken time reversal and zero churn number. Um, uh, <coughs> um, but it does have orbital magnetization. Uh, and it's able to go, from, uh, most important thing is able to go from a normal insulator to a uh, 2D topological insulator without ever closing the gap. Uh -huh. Was this how mysterious how it happened that the no hybridization point jumps the final position to the center of the, of the circle. Uh, uh, so that is, um, so, uh, um, um, yeah, so it's not maybe um, uh, so surprising. And uh, it, that was also, of course, an, uh, an artificial model system without this extra spin degree of freedom. And it was also mean field theory. But uh, so I can answer the question of why it happens in mean field theory. Uh, so um, you know, uh, uh, um, when I uh, 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 basically, uh, when I have no interactions, the band hybridization self energy has to vanish at k equals zero if I don't break any symmetries. If I have an S-wave exciton condensate, the band mixing self-energy can't vanish at k equals zero. And so uh, as you turn on more, as you increase the single particle physics from this broken symmetry exciton condensate state, uh, uh, you know, it, uh, this uh, uh, band point where the band mixing vanishes is moving towards the zero mass line. And uh, it's not uncommon, of course, in such circumstances for the uh, actual transition to end up being first order. So basically, it just it doesn't want to uh, move this uh, 
uh, doesn't want to move this zero line through the zero mass line if you, uh, you know, if you uh, use this um, maxim about thinking about the mean field interaction, exchange interaction energy of uh, uh, saying that you don't want, you want to have states where the orbital content of the occupied states does, doesn't change very rapidly with momentum then you can easily see that if you move this zero mixing point through the zero mass line, then in that region of momentum space, uh, the actual occupied state will be changing like crazy uh, as you change momentum. And that's the reason why it jumps, basically. Yeah, I can talk about it uh, um, more separately if that, if that made no sense, which is quite possible. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Just a naive question about uh, maybe the vocabulary. I was a bit confused. So your I understand your parameter A is uh, hybridization between your your band. Yeah. But you all, if I understood correctly, you also associated with the strength of the interaction. Is that right? Yeah. Or uh, phase diagram. Yeah. So this is A. It's a term in the single particle Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's the coefficient of K in the band hybridization, right? So. Band hybridization by symmetry vanishes at k equals zero and grows linearly. So it has units of energy times length, right? So in this phase diagram, all I've done is taken that thing which has units of energy times length and uh, made it dimensionless by uh, putting energies and units of a natural energy unit and lengths in terms of a natural length unit. So there are m many other ways you might make it dimensionless, but uh, yeah, that's the one I did. Go, go. How, how can you choose the parameter of the field? Uh, A? Yeah, yeah so uh, in the case of, I should have said this, uh, in the case of mercury telluride quantum wells, uh, it's just a property uh, of the electronic structure. The number for A is known. Uh, these these parameters, Bohr radius and Rydberg, they actually depend on the full three-dimensional dielectric environment and on the uh, and also on band structure properties. Uh, but <coughs> uh, so it turns out that if I take a mercury telluride quantum well, which you may recall from the uh, famous uh, work by uh, uh, Bernevig, Jang, uh, Molenkamp, etc. Uh, you can tune through this line, the band inversion line in mercury telluride by varying the width of a quantum well. And in that case, uh, <coughs> it turns out that this dimensionless parameter is somewhere over here on the right. So we don't expect any interesting interaction effects in uh, mercury telluride quantum well systems. But in the case of indium arsenide and gallium antimonide, uh, you can place, and people have uh, done this to some extent, but not explored it um, systematically, you can uh, take some of this barrier material, al aluminum antimonide, and place it between the indium arsenide and gallium antimonide quantum well layers. And uh, <coughs> the hybridization between the S electrons here and the P electrons here is um, is weaker anyway because they're on different layers. But by putting the barrier material there, you can systematically make it weaker and weaker and weaker. So this uh, l line here in this phase diagram is kind of where we think uh, indium arsenide, gallium antimonide lies with, uh, with no barrier uh, between the, with no inserted aluminum antimonide. So you should be able to explore all of this region experimentally. Of course, growing these uh, materials and making them of high enough quality is no easy job. Uh, and uh, so that's asking a lot to, um, say, prepare a whole bunch of samples. And, but I'm sure it's going to happen uh, as time goes on. Yeah. So there's been some work by Rui Du and collaborators in this direction. but. Uh, there's more in progress. Thank you. Okay.
Thank you.